Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. We're live. Whoa. Now, I have to tell you all, this feels like a special one. And the reason why is because when it look, comes to the introduction of who is today's guest, it, it says today's guest is dot, dot, dot. And I wrote many things because he is a marketer, an entrepreneur, um, ad, ad, ad age actually said he was one of the top 25 tech trailblazers to watch in marketing. And his company was also acquired by Nike. So he's actively doing things, trying things, pushing things, and he's the author of Customer Centricity. That's a cool word we're going to talk about later on today. Uh, Co-founder, director of Theta Equity Partners, and last but not least, professor of marketing at the Warden School of Business. Peter Fader, how are you, sir? Wonderful to talk to you. It's kind of funny that the day job comes last. Um, <laughs> Because that's, that's, you know, the, the professor thing still comes first and foremost. All the other stuff is, is wonderful, but it's icing on the cake. Right, right. Well, maybe it's more of a linear introduction for you. <laughs> sure, <laughs> so, sure. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we have so much to talk about. And really the theme for today is that idea of customer centricity, the customer, getting to know them, understanding them, but then also what we can predict. And idea, I, I know one of your... Your, your passions and fields of study is predictive analytics. So I really want to talk about these things and whatever else comes to mind. And so to start out, I'm going to pass you this. It's very heavy, but I think you, you got it. So that is Thor's hammer. I need you to take that and smash for me some kind of marketing myth, some kind of bogus strategy. I'm sure you see it all the time. You're now you're teaching people. Oh my! There's something up for us. Goodness, Casey, where where do I begin? Uh, I, I hope we have hours to do this. We do. We have uh, hours. I want to start right away with something that you just said that drives me bananas. Oh no! And that <laughs> is the you? idea of the customer. You know, Got back it. in the old days when, when marketing was just getting born, you know, the whole Mad Men thing, and, you know, which of these messages will the customer respond best to, or which version of the product will the customer like most? You know, back then when we had this singular view of the customer, that was okay. We couldn't do any better than that. But today, now that we have all this wonderful data and analytics and technology, the first thing that comes to mind is that there is no the customer. There's this vast array of customers who are not only different from each other, but they're wildly different from each other. And when you see it, when you do the predictive analytics thing and you see just how incredibly varied they are, you realize that the way to win the game isn't to kind of play right down the middle and aim at that average customer who doesn't exist, mm. but to try to really appreciate the spread among them and to ask yourself, how do I best take advantage of that? So in my world, it might sound kind of fancy, it might sound academic, but I celebrate customer heterogeneity. I celebrate the fact that our customers are wildly different from each other. And while that might be kind of a nuisance to some traditional marketers, it's also a tremendous opportunity to make more money than just playing it right down the middle. So you're just coming out, you know, guns blazing. You just, you know, like no holds barred, you know, re redefining marketing at, at, its, at its core. There is no customer. I, I think we've kind of also, that was like a suspicion we all had that, eh, well, this buyer profile is kind of generic, you know, like my buyer's 40 and has a dog and, and likes long walks in the park and not really, you know, and so we've all kind of felt that, but, but don't you need to? Don't you need to group people up? And you do, you do, you do. So, yeah. so, so I understand that we can't do one-to-one -one marketing at, at full commercial scale. I mean, if right. you have a small business and you really can know each and every customer, great, fine, that's terrific. But we all aspire to grow. We all aspire to open up that second store or that you know, separate division. And at some point, you can't do the hand-holding with each and every one. And so you have to figure out a way, instead of just abandoning the idea of, of personalization and customization, you have to figure out, first of all, how to use data, analytics, and technology to be able to sort of capture that mom and pop feel. But also, exactly to your point, um, what's the appropriate level of grouping? 
Do we just go with, you know, the high, medium, low segments? Do we go all the way to one to one? Yeah. Find some kind of level in the middle, micro segments where they're refined enough that, that they really are different and we could talk about them, treat them differently, but there's still enough aggregation there that we don't just drive ourselves crazy trying to cater to, to each and every customer separately. That's the challenge. Now that part, I'm not saying it's easy, but, but the, the hard part is actually just getting the mindset. Uh, and, and then once you're committed to it, then it becomes easier to deal with it. And the mindset specifically is, is what? Just embracing the multiple paths they take? It's three things. Number one, it's embracing, here's that big word again, heterogeneity, that the customers are wildly different from each other. I'm and, not sure I want to attempt that word. I'll let you. <laughs> yeah, well, then you got to practice it because you got to breach it mm. uh, so that customers are wildly different from each other. And it's not just a matter of having the persona. It's having the three, four, 10 different segments. So number one, lots of variation there. And if we can take advantage of it, we'll make more money. Number two, that the way that we're going to build those segments isn't on the basis of demographics or easily observable things. It's going to be on the basis of customer lifetime value. It's going to be on the basis of how much is this customer probably going to be worth to us in the future. And then number three, that once we have those groupings and once we have our kind of a, a grip around these, these, these future values, these predictive analytics, that the number of use cases that spawn from them are so vast that it's not only a matter of, hmm, which message do we send to which customer at which time, but there's like 30, 40 different use cases, many of which get well outside the scope of marketing that can help us create alignment and profitability much more than the kind of separate siloed kind of thing that goes on with most companies. That's the big three. Got it. So how do you, uh, you know, you see like, em so embrace that long word, Say it, say it, Casey, say okay, it. Okay, say it for me, and then I'll, I'll say it back to you. Customer heterogeneity. Heterogeneity? Sounds good. Okay. Say it okay. 10 more times. I don't, I don't know if I spilled it right <laughs> in my notes, but I like that. Okay, so embracing customer heterogeneity, and uh, <laughs> how, how do you do that? It just, it just an acknowledging it, kind of like a hat tip? No, 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 no. You know, that's the problem. There's a lot of people out there uh, across all industries that are doing just that, just, that are checking a box, that are, yeah. you know, just saying some words and saying, ah, we're good. Uh, to me, it's real, that you, you want to measure it, you want to measure it the right way, you want to use it, you want to be held accountable for it. So let's give a little history lesson over here. It all goes back to an industry that none of us aspire to be associated with, who really laid the groundwork for everything that we're doing today in digital marketing, wow. and that is direct marketing. We go okay. back to our forefathers who were selling late night Ginsu knives and this and that. And while we might not so much associate with the products they were selling, we actually do aspire to follow the practices that they were espousing, which is that the customer, each individual customer is the unit of analysis, not the product. And that if we can figure out the value of each of those customers and figure out which ones are more responsive to our messages and our outreach and our products and find ways to further deepen those relationships, find more stuff to sell them uh, and extract value from them and find more customers like them, that we can make more money than simply saying, here is the product, who else can we sell it to? That is the uh -huh. fundamental difference between product centricity and customer centricity. They did it first. Every other company now is standing on their shoulders, whether we know it or not. And we're in so much a better position because of the kind of CRM systems that we have, because of our capability to customize offerings. It's just a matter of taking their vision from the 1970s and just doing it on a, on a tactical and strategic basis. Got it. So Mad Men was trying to hawk the product and then, and then these infomercials came along and they said, who are these people? What will they buy as opposed to what can we sell them? That is right. And it was yeah. the direct marketers. Let's give a big shout out to Lester Wonderman, the, the father of direct marketing, who literally put those two words together back on November 29th, 1967. Literally on that date, he said, you know, there's this emerging practice that we really should be focusing on the different customers instead of the uh -huh. product. And a new industry was born, and really it created all of the stuff that we're doing today, but there's a lot of people out there who are unaware of the legacy and unaware of some of the best practices 
awesome stuff that was being done in the 70s and 80s, in some sense more effective than what's being done today. We got to read those direct marketing 101 books and just raise it a level, given all the cool data, analytics, and technology that our forefathers couldn't have even dreamed about. What do they do right? Like what was part of their, and they're thinking, they're thinking customer focused instead of product focused. How did they apply that? And was there something in their heads? To, like what made them break out of the mold? Okay, number one, it was a, a rigorous focus on calculating, validating, leveraging customer lifetime value. Got let's it. figure out who the best customers are and let's, let's do it in a, in a measurable way. Let's get really specific about it. And if you're interested, Casey, we'll, we'll dive into that. So let's really, really use that as a way not yeah. only to guide all of the tactics that we're doing, but to gauge how well we're doing them. On the back end, it's not just a matter of saying how many of those you know, um, model car sets did we sell, but how much did we elevate the future value of the customers? Or what's the value of the customers we acquired through those product sales? It doesn't matter how much stuff we sell. Right. It matters how much of the customer value that we've created in the process. So number one is that idea of really rigorously using customer lifetime value. And number two, it's this idea of customer centricity. Instead of saying, we have a certain kind of R&D expertise. We're good at developing certain kinds of products or services. Hmm, what other services can we spin off of it? No, 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 no. It's, hey, we've got these really valuable customers over here. What other stuff can we be doing with and for them right. that's outside of our comfort zone and expertise? But we got to find a way to deepen those relationships because if we can keep them with us for a long time, they're going to be so incredibly valuable that whatever it costs us to get that, that expertise is going to be well worth it. Yeah, that's I could. Different way of thinking. Yeah, no, I could see that happening for sure, especially in like software. Are you designing this because it's a cool sprocket or is every single one of your customers, your early customers like demanding this feature? I need this. I was, ha it happened to me today. I was looking at this, this chat and I was like, oh, I need this feature on this app and I'm dying to have it. You know, if, and if they're, if they deliver that, you know, so, you know, continue to sign me up forever. That's exactly what I and, need. And here's the problem. Uh, yeah. There's too many companies that will look at exactly that scenario and I'll say, well, maybe Casey wants it, but there's not enough appeal for that feature. And so we can't really justify the R&D or the right. rollout of it because not enough people would want it. If instead they looked at their customers through the lens of customer lifetime value mm -hmm. and they said, Casey's worth a lot. And there's other customers like him who also want that feature man, you know, we really ought to do that because that's going to enhance the value of those really good customers and help us acquire more like them. It makes it much easier to justify and, again, validate that, that kind of decision. That's the twist, and it's not hard to do it. It's just a matter of mindset and culture, and most companies just shy away from it unless we could sell a lot of it. Were they, were they too short-sighted looking, looking at there's not enough quantity right now of customers? Because it's hard to say that's wrong. I mean, they're trying to prioritize their time. But I think what we're saying is their lens is too narrow that, that I may be a customer for life. I mean, my, my 10K may be for the next 20 years as opposed to you know, a customer that's here and gone. And the problem is, you're exactly right. And so it's not that companies are being dumb. It's that the, the metrics that they're being engaged on, that, that investors are insisting on, are short term. It is just all about volume, cost. Uh, and so we got to change that narrative. And that's why right. so much of what I'm doing these days focuses on this idea of customer-based corporate valuation. Let's go back to our investors. And just as Jeff Bezos is doing every quarter when he announces an ever larger loss on the e-commerce business, <laughs> look at all this customer asset value that we've created here. Maybe it's not showing up on the balance sheet or the income statement or the cash flow statement, but it's real. And yeah. you can measure it and you can, you, can, you can invest against it. You can borrow against it. If we can just get people to see all that customer lifetime value, then it's going to be, then we're going to be able to justify those longer term investments in the right kinds of features for the right kinds of customers. And what I found is that maybe by starting with the CFO instead of the CMO, mm. it's going to give us the cover to be able to make these kinds of investments and then give marketing the capability to really do that stuff the right way. It's true. Sometimes we can be a little creative in the marketing world and you might throw a term like ROI out there, which is a financial term. And it's like we're entering new territory here. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you can get eaten alive. So I would love to, you know, what, 
we keep saying this word. Let's define it. Let's understand it. Customer lifetime value. Absolutely. So uh, people get the basic notion of it. Yeah. Uh, that's great. A lot of people, you know, if we ask all your listeners, raise your hand if you've said those words sometime in the last month or two. A lot of hands will go up. Mm. But like we said before, too often it is this sort of cheap talk kind of thing. But let's first define it. Uh, it is the future profitability, the future projected profitability for each and every customer. We're going to project how long is this overall relationship going to last? And over that horizon, how many orders can we expect from you? And for each of those orders, what's the basket size? And for each of those basket sizes, what's the profitability? What's the margin that we're extracting from it? If we can project each of those things separately, and then, and we can, it's not that hard right. actually, and then add it all up, we can come up with a pretty good guess about what each customer is going to be worth. And so I want to do that. Uh, and I am doing that. I want to do it rigorously. I want to come up with, with sets of procedures that will make it as scalable as possible, as comparable as possible across businesses, geographies, uh, and, and so on. That's my job, is to both establish the methods and then demonstrate to companies that you can do this and that you want to do this because there's right. more money to be made. So the customer, life, in, in some sense, not to sell myself short, but doing the CLE calculations, that's the easy part. It's getting companies to trust it and to really, really focus on it instead of saying, yeah, we do that too. That's yeah. the hard part, the cold yeah. Like a metric that just kind of lives in the basement. Oh yeah, we've calculated that. That buyer profiles are that way too. I think we we did that last year. We made some. I don't remember using them ever, but we made them. You know. So um, you mentioned the get them interested, then get them using it. I'm interested. So let's take my company for instance. Yeah, B two B services, right? Consulting work. Am I just simply looking at the different? different lengths of time people have engaged with us and that's a good that's a big part of it so yeah. we're going to go back here we go again to our forefathers in direct marketing who, yes. who had laser focused on this even though lasers weren't invented yet but right. um they said we need to look at our past historic data and come up with some easily observable metrics that will be correlated with and therefore presumably predictive of what these customers will be worth in the future Mm -hmm. and they spent a lot of time just mucking around in data, very poor data that they had back then, to find those observable metrics that were predictive of future value. And you know what they came up with? The rubric of RFM, recency, frequency, monetary value. So if you can tell me the last time that this person placed an order with me, how many orders or other valuable interactions we've had with them over the last, say, two years, and the average size or profitability of those orders, you just give me those three things, recency, frequency, monetary value, that's it. And I can make a, an alarmingly accurate projection of how many orders are going to place in the future, for how long, and for how much money. Really? I, I can give you the math. That's actually not the hard part. That's what we've commercialized. That's what I do a lot of research on. Yeah. The hard part really is, again, is the discipline to, to say, as you just said, Casey, really. So all the other stuff, all the sexy stuff, like where you're located in the social graph or your <laughs> usage of social media or biometrics right. or geolocation, all of that stuff is nice to know, but it's not very predictive. As long as you have a reasonable transaction log system and you have that and all of your listeners have that simple CRM platform. Yeah, CRM you have what you need in order to make these projections. And then it's just a matter of having the discipline to do it, to validate it, and to figure out the, the 50 creative ways to use it. Okay, so the discipline to do it then. So let's talk about that. So I've, you know, I've done the math offline. Um, you got your equations to your part. That's the easy part. Now it comes to the hard part of actually using it, the discipline, putting it into, pr into practice. Any recommendations there? So it's, it's get creative. Let's just think about all of the tactics that we ordinarily do, customer acquisition, customer retention, customer development, yeah. but, but uh, do those things, but look at them through the lens of changes in lifetime value. Mm. So we're going to do some kind of retention campaign, right? We're going we're gonna to look at our customers who are at most risk of leaving, and we're going to invest some money to keep them to hang around. Well, let's do it. Let's do two things differently. Number one, instead of just lining the customers up based on how likely they are to leave, let's line them up instead on the basis of how much future value is at risk. 
Right. Because you know how it works that you're a so so customer for your cable company, but you're likely to leave and they're going to give you all kinds of free stuff to keep you around. Well, they're <laughs> making a mistake because you're not that valuable. Right. Whereas someone else who maybe is at slightly lower risk, but much greater financial value, they got to be sitting on that customer's doorstep. So, number one, let's use CLV as kind of triage to prioritize which customers we're going to deal with. And number two, on the back end, after we run that campaign, instead of saying, how many lives did we save? Let's say, how much future value did we save or enhance through those tactics? And that's the way it's always going to work. You pick any tactic, again, acquisition, retention, development, you name it. Uh, let's, let's prioritize it. Let's set that campaign up on the basis of lifetime value. And let's right. evaluate it on the back end in terms of the changes to it. Again, that doesn't come naturally to most companies. But it's not, it's not that hard. You just have to think about it differently. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it, it's it kind of a flip and it reminds me, I was just up in Toronto and I got reminded about the idea of that scarcity mindset versus abundance. And it's scarcity mindset, you're kind of squirreled up. You're probably looking to prevent churn and, uh, you know, kind of just protect yourself from the cold winters of New England, whereas that abundant mindset or just the lifetime value, I, I like that at that point, instead of how many lives were saved, it's that, that future, I think, would you say value that was preserved or um, exactly earnings that were preserved. It makes total sense. How, Cause you're right. Some people may not be a good long-term fit. They may not have a lot lifetime value. I, yeah, yeah. The problem is too many companies, there's really two, two problems that, that, that drive this, that, that yeah. are they're kind of hard to overcome. Number one, uh, every company for natural reasons that we've discussed before obsesses over cost, cost of acquisition, cost of retention, because those costs, they're, they're easily measurable. They're visceral. Right. There's no argument with them. We know what it's going to cost us to acquire a new customer. Whereas this whole value thing it seems amorphous, it seems ethereal, it seems sure. very sensitive to different kinds of conditions that we have no control over. If I can just get people to trust those projected lifetime value numbers as much as they trust cost, they'll start to think differently. They'll start to think about value instead of cost, just like that abundant scarcity right. metaphor. So, so that's, that's a, a big part of it. Now I forgot the second point on that. <laughs> but that, that's a, a really big thing, to think about you know, value created and enhanced instead of just kind of uh, cost. You know, there's that old expression. I'm sure you've said it, Casey. Every one of your listeners has said it and, uh, and thinks about it, which is it costs X times more to acquire a customer than to retain one. Absolutely. So you really should focus on the customers you have. Yeah. And while that statement might be true, it probably is, my take on it is stop being such a freaking cheapskate. Don't run your business on the basis of minimizing costs. Run your basis on the basis of, run your business on the basis of Casey. Say it for me. Increasing revenue. Increasing value. 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 Exactly right. And if we can just get people, and when you say that to people, they go, "Yeah, it makes sense. That makes sense." So if I can just make the value part as 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 trustworthy, and and again, just like we can't live without it, uh, then that's when we start to to see movements in this direction. That makes sense. I was recently having a conversation um, with, with my team and we we're talking about the idea of net profit and, 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 you know, you could, you could basically create the company and manufacture it and move it around and do all these different actions to increase that net profit. But that means, you know, reducing costs and, and, and that's one way of looking at it, but yet at the same time you could grow the thing and then that can, so it's almost like there's two different sides of it. It's I, I get it. You're right. A lot of companies are like, what was the cost to acquire? What was the cost to do this? We, and, and instead, are you swimming up the, the stream? Is everyone else going in one direction? And well, see, So, uh, so I, I kind of stumbled into some of these lifetime value models. Yeah. A lot of them I didn't even invent. I found them from other smarter people. Again, forefathers in direct marketing. It's just my job to refine them, to make them more scalable, to get people to appreciate them. Early 2000s, I was shouting about this stuff, and every company was ignoring me, saying, eh, it's just some you know, ivory tower academic, what does he know? <laughs> I did two things to try to really bring it to life. Number one is I wrote book number one over here, Customer Centricity, this idea of focus on the right customers for strategic advantage. I like that, that. You know, there's a fundamentally different business model, and the sky is falling if you just chase after products and volume and costs. And then number two, 
I founded that first startup, a company called Zodiac, to say, to prove to companies that you really can do this. And look at all these other firms that are doing it very successfully and making money on it. So between giving people the motivation and then helping them implement it, uh, that, that has really, uh, and, and part of it is just companies on their own coming to it. But that's really elevated the conversation in and, and a, and a wonderful, heartwarming way. And then there's huh, book number two, which is focusing less on kind of definition, motivation, aspiration. Here's the new book about implementation. Yes. So, you know, how do we really do this? And again, what are all the use cases and case studies of companies that have done it successfully? So it's this combination of yin and yang of strategy and, and models uh, that have been, uh, you know, getting a lot of people to start thinking about it. But to be honest, I'm not declaring victory. There is still a long <laughs> way to go. And, you know, most of, of the, the people listening to you, it, it, to them is either the first time they're thinking about it or they're still somewhat skeptical and they're saying, eh, maybe that applies to electronic arts, but not to my, you know, simple, you know, a home improvement company. It applies to you too. Um, and they're just going to keep spreading the gospel until people really accept this. Not to say it's the right strategy for everybody, but at least deserves consideration and testing to, to see if maybe it is the right one. You know, when it comes to choosing your right customer and zeroing in, do you see that there's a, I mean, it's a challenge for companies to, I mean, let some business go or not chase after every breathing person, every click of the mouse, chase them all cold it's, call them and it's such a natural sell. point you see the problem is we take it very personally oh, yeah. the customer was unhappy we're saying well that's a, that's a failure on my part what did i do to not make them happy and what is it that i can do that i must do to right. win over their 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 trust and loyalty you got to get past that it goes back to that that big word what was that big word what do we celebrate uh, customer uh, that was a uh heterogeneity. You got it. <laughs> customers are just inherently different from each other. And with that in mind, they're not all born to love you. And if some of them are, eh, it's not your fault. Doesn't mean you should fire them either. But, it, but trying to turn those ugly ducklings into beautiful swans, as nice as that sounds, it's kind of romantic. It's also kind of inefficient. And, and in many cases, you're better off not firing them, but just not catering to them either and uh -huh. spending that time effort and money to acquire better customers who better who more closely resemble the good ones and filling the funnel with disproportionately more good ones than before right it's hard to get companies just to let go like that when, when trying to zero in on the right customer because i'd even been trying to do this for the last several i'd say months and quarters it's probably like all my life but uh, i've been trying to zero in on even our ideal customer and you know there a lot of the basic things come up of you know what industry are they in what uh you know how much have they paid us so far um you know what where are they located you know those kind of things but in, i'm hearing that it all is pointing back to that lifetime value is that are there other parts to it, or is it just really it comes well, down? It's, to it's primarily that. So let's okay. first pull out our magic wand, look at all of our existing customers, yeah. figure out the lifetime values, and say, what's up with these super valuable customers? What makes them different than everybody else? And let's find ways to double down on those characteristics. And for me, very much to your point, Casey, we can look at demographics, we can look at social, whatever. And if, and if that tends to be a, a factor that separates them, great. But I'd rather not start there. I'd rather look at acquisition characteristics. I'd rather say, what's the first product or service that they bought from us? Or what campaign brought them in? Or what's the first, uh, you know, let's, let's find things from the moment we acquired them that, that tends to stand out. So we can right. invest more on those acquisition activities. Not saying that's perfect, but that's where our primary focus should be because it is more actionable. It is more tangible. Yes, we can look at all the demographics and all that stuff too, but you're often going to find that it's these behavioral actions that kind of pop more and that you really can control and invest it. Got it. Got it. And focus in on, again, their, their future value, not, not just looking at the present. Um, and, I, and I could see how that, that the previous uh, acronym with the math involved the, the frequency and the recency tying into the value that they've, they've spent because just because they bought once the people that are buying over and over and over again, that's a factor as well. And those things all come together. 
They really do. It's remarkable about it because, it, again, that that acronym is RFM, Recency Frequency Monetary Value. And you might wonder, why is it RFM and not FMR or MRF? I mean, why did they choose the letters in that order? It's not yeah. even alphabetical. Our forefathers in direct marketing all those years ago said recency trumps frequency, which trumps monetary value. And you know what? They're right. It's remarkable that when you look at the behavioral data and when you see how these simple behavioral indicators line up with future lifetime value, recency is more important. So the, how long ago since they last did something with you is more important, is more telling than the fact that they did three things versus five things with you over the past two years. That's not intuitive but it's powerful and it's robust. And, and that's why we just have to give people the discipline to know not only which cues to look at, but how to prioritize them like that. Yeah, I, I, now, first of all, I was gonna kind of geek out on the math side because if it's technically multiplication, does it not even matter the order of the, uh, the letters? Right multiplication. And if I hand you the formula, and again, I'm very happy to, there's no oh, secret. Yeah, yet. no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get the book and the I'll, workbook. I'll share and, all this, yeah. this stuff with you. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a little messier than that. It's, messier. It, it, it. it's not quite multiplication. Um, uh, and so in some sense, uh, 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 recency really does come first. Uh, in fact, let's, let's think it. about it this way. If you've bought many, many times from us in the past, but you haven't bought in a long time. Yeah, millions of dollars, but you, you do, haven't purchased for like gone. 10 years. Yeah. And the more that you bought back then, the deader you are today. So at some point, wow. high frequency, sorry to get technical with you here, but it kind of bites you in the ass because you did so much stuff with me before but it's been so long since you've done it, you're probably gone. You've probably moved to a different vendor or you're no longer yeah. interested in this category. So, so recency really does come first. Uh, and recency is always good, but sometimes frequency can actually turn around and become a bad thing. So it's my job to understand all of these weird nonlinear trade-offs, but they're not that hard. And even in some cases, we can even do this in Microsoft Excel just mm. to kind of get going with it. So again, let's not geek out further than that right now. Although agreed, agreed. But yeah, it makes it makes sense. And and as you're describing that too, I could also see the direct marketers and now even us digital marketers and marketing automators. That's kind of a funny word. I, I could see us all kind of thinking, huh, how could I get more recency out of my customers? Knowing that's that it's the most right. important. I think it's a great question because you know, look at so many people who have their dashboards in their CRM system. Yeah. And very often the dashboard will include different metrics of frequency and monetary value. But you show me a company that has some notion of recency on its dashboard, you'll never see it. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it, that's the metric. That's, that's number one on the list. So part of it, part of my job is just to take what our forefathers back in direct marketing said and just shout it even louder, just to kind of take some of these simple metrics and make them even more visible and, 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 uh, and, and visceral than, than, uh, than anyone would ever think. How how do you think how does that kind of translate into the B2B world if you're signing an agreement for a year and oh I'd love our customers to you know sign up we had someone sign up for 100 hours you know or 200 hours that's fantastic um, versus I mean frequency would or, or recency would say you know 20 hours every month I'd love the bigger deal but am I is that hurt does that hurt me in the end with this yeah, there's, there's actually two questions buried in there Casey both really good uh, first and foremost that whole RFM thing that I mentioned that doesn't apply to every business. Mm. That only applies to businesses that are selling stuff kind of on a one-off transactional basis. Yep. But if, there's, if it's a contractual setting, if it's a subscription setting and people are you know, making that payment uh, for a year and then making it right. again, where notions like customer retention really mm. make sense, whole different ballgame. Okay. RFM only applies in the non-contractual setting where we just look at these one-off purchases and we say, huh, it's been a while since they bought anything. Right. I wonder if they're just taking a snooze or I wonder if they're gone. So it's a completely different set of models, actually simpler models in the contractual setting compared to the non-contractual. Um, so that's super important right there. But I am very happy to say that once we look at that difference, contractual versus non-contractual, that's the big one. Mm -hmm. Once you look within one of those business settings, then I don't care if it's B2B versus B2C. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking in a subscription-oriented setting and you are signing contracts, I do not care if it's, you know, if, if it's some kind of SaaS B2B software thing or if it's a, a meal of the month club. 
right. patterns there are remarkably similar. Uh -huh. And the trade-offs between acquisition, retention, development are re remarkably interchangeable. On the non-contractual setting, same kinds of issues. It's just, it's just amazing how we can move from a retailer to a pharmaceutical company to a travel service to you know, other kinds of B2B, you know, um, uh, just supply chain, logistics kind of thing. Like at Zodiac, at my, my first startup, doing yeah. the predictive analytics, we were just moving seamlessly between all of these different kinds of settings, mostly on the non-contractual side where it's harder. Um, and the basic patterns and practices were kind of identical. B2B actually has it easier in a way because mm. you tend to have a more direct relationship with the customers. You can easily measure who's doing what. You're not intermediated uh, as you are if you're Procter & Gamble. Uh, that's number one. Number two, you have a smaller customer base, and so it, it's a little bit easier to, to understand who those better customers are and what makes them different. So, so these models actually apply better in a B2B setting. Well, it, just as well, but they're actually sure. often easier to implement in B2B than in B2C. What would the contractual acronym or formula be? It's actually easier in the contractual because all yeah. we, we don't have to worry about the, so what did you do while you were under contract? All we really have to say is, um, you know, how many times have you renewed since we acquired you as a customer? Mm. So, we, so it, it's a much easier retention rate to, to measure and monitor. And as you uh, renew with us for another time and another time, we'll ask ourselves, so how much higher is your lifetime value than someone who just signed on with us. And then it takes us back to the conversation about, so if you are threatening to leave, how much more mm -hmm. willing should we be able to kind of give you goodies than that newbie who just signed on? So we can get just a lot more guidance about both the allocation of resources as well as the evaluation of those programs. It's actually much, when I teach my predictive analytics course, session number one, is about projecting customer retention in mm. the contractual setting. Nice. That's the easy stuff. We don't get into the non-contractual until session seven. <laughs> it's actually not that hard. And again, let's stop it there just because it starts getting technical. But right. we're all happy to point out those kinds of resources uh, in, in that setting. God, I'm glad you mentioned that too because I was just thinking, you know, without, without that predictive, and I think we should get into that next, without the predictive, you know, if this one customer is complaining or some, something's happening, but they've only renewed, they haven't renewed yet, or, I mean, it's almost like people have given you, renewed the most and done the most, you're going to favor them more because you would be able to calculate more lifetime value, whereas That's someone who hasn't renewed and that. hasn't spent, you and wouldn't know much. about this story. You know it, you've lived it, everybody has, where you're a, a long-term, let's say, cable customer, mm -hmm. and you see the deals that they're giving out to those newbies, and you get all upset saying, how come <laughs> you're not giving me that discount? And they go, humina, humina, humina. Uh, these companies are overspending on unproven customers and sometimes taking greater risks than they should with, this, uh, with the well-established ones. Now, having said that, Interesting. I'm not a big fan of discounts, okay? We should be right. cutting all of that. We should be adding value instead of cutting prices. Right. Um, uh, but we should be doing it in proportion to the projected lifetime value. Uh, and companies, they just, they just don't get that. So do you, do you need the predictive? To be, if a company hasn't even purchased from me yet, am, am I able to predict what their future lifetime value might be based on their customers? That's a problem. That's what us in academia call the cold start problem. Yeah. This prospect, they're just working their way through the funnel. How do we know what their CLV is going to be? Right. Let me try to simplify it for you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at all of your characteristics. And again, it's less about demographics, but it's more about the funnel journey that you followed so far. You know, are you using the digital assets? Have you tried this, the, the demo or whatever else? I'm going to look at all of my existing customers and I'm going to say, how closely do you resemble each of them? Right. And what is their CLV? And I'm going to basically say, you know, if, if I look at the CLVs of the customers that you most closely resemble and say, that's going to give me some sense of what you might be worth if and when I acquire you. I mean, that just gives you some sense about some it. Sense it. Yeah. Again, it, the hard part is just thinking that way. Yeah. You have the magic lifetime values. It's actually pretty easy to implement that. And again, in my previous startup, 
we were doing that just at full commercial scale for lots of different companies, B2B, B2C, product, service, big and small, uh, just to kind of give them guidance as to what kind of, uh, you know, journal, uh, sorry, funnel journey uh, tend to be most associated with high CLV. It's not a promise, not a guarantee, but it is some pretty good guidance. Uh, and then not only gives you a sense of that lifetime value, but about how you should be allocating your uh, acquisition efforts to kind of tilt it in that direction. It makes sense that people would be hiring you to do that. Cause as you describe it, and I know once you have the formula, things can fall into place. But for me, you know, I think a lot of us don't know the specifics of the funnel journey. And, and I, I, mean, I didn't even know as a marketer until I chatted with Adele Ravella who was saying, look, what you think is a buyer persona is actually just a, a lame buyer profile. You actually mm -hmm. have to get in there, know the journey, know the steps, know what's going on. So right. I mean, we hadn't done that in before. And I, I didn't even know that because a lot of those vendors out there are going to be proclaiming the profile that surface level demographics and, and yeah. so much more beneath the surface. Yeah, that, you, you, you hit the nail on the head that in the old days, all we had were demographics. All yeah. we could do is size a customer up based on what they looked like. Um, but today we get so much richer information and the ability to draw insights from it. All the action, exactly your words, is below the surface. We're going right. to look at that observable data. We're going to look at the RFM, but we're not going to paint someone. We're not going to tattoo those numbers on them. That's just kind of a fuzzy indication of what they're truly worth. But once we run these models and we get a sense of just, you know, so what is their buying propensity? What is their propensity to drop out and use those things mm. for the profiling and for the resource allocation? Uh, that's when the, 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 uh, the, the real action starts. It, and again, it doesn't come yeah. naturally to most companies. I understand that. That's my job is to make these, these right. policies clear and, and actionable. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I think a lot of us are to, to kind of get a sense for this and obviously go grab the book and the workbook and implement. Um, is, this, is this predictive analytics? Is that what this is what we're, what we're talking about? Or is that something like what, what's that to you? And I mean, you're, you, you live in this. Yeah, realm. right, right, right. Yeah, so again, the predictive analytics, that's the RFM, that's, that's all this get below the surface thing. Got and it. that part is, you know, it, it's, it's technical, but necessary and, and worth the investment. Again, the harder part is to, is to get the company aligned around it instead of just making a box to check or instead of just, you know, throwing it over to the nerds in, in analytics, but to think about how every aspect of the organization can benefit from it. I'm going to circle back around right. to that idea of CBCV customer-based corporate valuation. Now, let's, let's find use cases for finance. Let's find use cases for, for supply chain and product development, as well as marketing, sales, and service. Sure. If we can get everybody aligned around these patterns and all that sort of thing, that it's just going to make it so much easier to create that kind of alignment, accountability. Uh, and and it's, we're far from declaring victory, but it's, it's remarkable how much progress we've made since I first wrote book number one a few years ago, how much interest there is, genuine interest, not me having right. to shove it down people's throats uh, in this stuff. And, and, and I'm really optimistic about what these next 5, 10, 20 years are going to look like. Makes sense. You've mentioned a couple times now that the hard part is actually using the data, which I guess I've kind of not even really thought about because I'm, I'm lost in calculation land trying to calculate this, but I could see that, you know, if you've been doing this for a while and also your company was doing these services for people, I, I, I almost, I almost could predict that what happens is you do all this work. Maybe they paid you hundreds of thousands of dollars to figure this stuff out. And then you, you present the findings and then do they just not use the data? I mean, I can, this happens to a lot of technology. Well, it's very quite a bit. Yeah. And that, that's why I needed the one, two punch. I needed the models and I needed the narrative to say, okay, here's what you do with it now. Uh, and, and obviously it worked pretty well and it was wonderful to see Nike basically validating it by buying the company. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it's, it, that by itself gets a lot of companies to say, huh, maybe there really is something here. Uh, and that's why in the, with the newer company, uh, Fate Equity Partners, uh, we've really come to the realization that while we want to win over every corner of the organization, mm. starting with finance is, is the right way to go. Because if we can win them over, everybody else is, is going to uh, follow suit from there. So I'm not a finance guy. I'm a marketing professor. But I have great respect right. for their role in the organization, their ability to actually embrace some of these metrics and predictions in ways that marketers are sometimes a little skittish about. 
Uh, but ultimately, my goal is to get the marketers on board as well. That makes sense. So what, 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 is, what has you excited about where this is now? And I mean, it could be with the predictive world, just marketing in general. Are there things that are coming to your attention that have you, you know, staying up late at night reading things? Oh, absolutely. And again, I have to just admit that it's because it's such a focus now yeah. is on the, uh, on the finance side, on the corporate valuation side. So one of my, my hobby these days is to look at, at companies as they're going public, as they put out their F1 filing, yes. their IPO, and to reverse engineer it and say, what is that company really worth? Let's forget about the blah, blah that's going on on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. let's, let's look below those numbers and make the same kinds of projections that I was saying before. How many customers are they going to acquire? How long are they going to stay? How many transactions will they make? How valuable will those transactions be? Add all that stuff up and say, that's the value of the company. And in some cases, coming up with numbers that are wildly divergent, mm. from what the traditional Wall Street people are saying, but saying it with naming names and saying with gusto and saying, you know what, we're right. Uh, and so again, if, if people are interested, it's a wonderful showcase for this stuff. Not trying to sell anything, but if you go to thetaequity.com and look at some of these IPO analyses that we've done for companies like Slack and Lyft and Revolve and Farfetch, and to look at the numbers that we came up with and to look at the performance of those stocks after the IPOs and to see how well it supports our thesis that by looking at the customer data, you get a better view of what's really going on there. Now, not a lot of companies are disclosing the right kinds of metrics. That's part of what keeps me up at night in an excited way. <laughs> right. Let's change that conversation. Let's get more companies to disclose the right metrics. Let's get investors to pound on the door. Right. You must disclose these things. That's not happening this year. It's not happening next year. But I think it is happening over the next 5 to 10 to 20. And again, if we can change the, the narrative in finance, that's going to make it so much easier for us marketers, us direct and digital marketers, to do our thing more effectively and more collaboratively. I can see how there's a combination of these metrics of what's actually important and the proof is in the pudding. When you, if you're predicting, look, this thing might be a little overvalued. They've got a great logo, but and they're going public right now. But you know, when you look at the numbers and you look at some of these, the RFMs and those things, it's not looking good or it's looking a little bigger than it is. And Absolutely. And the stock eventually catches up to that prediction. That, that, and that's exactly what's been happening. And, and it goes both ways. Sometimes sure. there are companies that are grossly overvalued. Oh, wait there. <clears throat> um, and other <laughs> companies that are undervalued, like Slack uh, and, and others. Uh, so we're not out there to, to devastate companies. Sure. Um, we're just out there to tell the truth uh, and to give visibility, credibility for the marketing metrics and activities that can help create that value and, and, and in a sustainable way. That makes a lot of sense. Very cool. Who are you? Where did you come from? How did you become the sage of the, the uh, business and marketing entrepreneurial world? You know, it's funny. I'm, I'm doing the same thing that I was doing as a, as a seven-year-old. I'm just obsessed with numbers and patterns and data. As a kid growing up, uh, I was obsessed with two things. One was sports statistics, primarily baseball. Sure. I was into all of that stuff before there were saber metrics. I was just uh, always obsessed with it. The second thing that always obsessed me still does are, believe it or not, dollar bill serial numbers. Really? Mom would go to the grocery store. She'd come back with all the dollars and I'd look at them and say, well, this is a cool number over here. And sure enough, as embarrassing as it is, I own the website coolnumbers.com. Check it out. Uh, where I just basically say, what's the <laughs> of any of these eight digit numbers? Uh, it's, it's nutty. So that's all I like to do is I like to predict things. I like to look for patterns in data. I thought I'd end up on Wall Street or in consulting or something like that. But then some nutty marketing professor up at MIT said, you ought to become a marketing professor. And I said, you ought to get your head checked. Uh, but here I am 40 years later, uh, and my whole career is a tribute to her. If you look up there, you'll see my fairy godmother uh, yeah. just basically saying, you know what? It was someone who said, if you could take those skills and you can use them in a way that's pretty unique, that's pretty impactful, that's pretty enjoyable, and that's my job today is to find other unsuspecting people who like math, who like numbers and say, you ought to be a marketing professor too. Yeah, right. Super lucky that I'm still doing today what I was doing as a kid 
uh, but 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 getting such joy and and you know professional accomplishment out of it. For sure, and I think the joy is a critical part of it. I mean, I was just looking at cool numbers and there was a bill with all fours on it or one, two, three, four, five. It's almost like a poker game. Oh my gosh, you've got a, a nine number straight here. Um, this is fantastic. Yeah, so I could see that being fun just to kind of look and see the numbers around us. Stop right there. You're, you're embarrassing yourself. No, no. <laughs> but no, I, I, I'm i fascinated by it. It's actually amazing. When you put it out there, how a lot of people yeah. say, this is kind of fun. Uh, and very often I'll use that as just kind of an icebreaker and then say, let me tell you something else that's fun. Customer lifetime value. <laughs> and, and as different sure. as it sounds, it really does all fit together. For sure. I, and I can see someone trying to buy that domain from you. It's pretty good, pretty good cool numbers. Like there's all sorts of uses for that. Like, nope, nope, this is my domain. You can't touch it. Right. Did, yeah. Went to school for math. How did you make the the connection to marketing because it really was i the, yeah. the story i told you is, is god's honest truth that is this one professor shout out to lee mcallister who's a professor at the university of texas now and she really did come to me and twist my arm and said math guy ought to go into marketing and i really did question her but she this was 1980 so that was actually in school that was in college when that yeah, happened that 1983 was, wow she laid out remember that 1983 that was 500 years ago um, and she laid out this vision of what marketing would become with the kinds of data sources and everything that we take for granted today. Wow. And she said, you are perfectly positioned to lead the way in that world and to take advantage of it and to you know, help companies extract value from it. Right. Uh, and, I, and I thought she was nuts. But I, but I was, but she's very persuasive and she talked me into it. And that's why all I can do is thank her and pay it forward. Because there really is a lot of room for just a you know nerdy mathy guy like me to go into a field that you usually associate with creativity and people right. skills, things that I completely lack. <laughs> um, but I think it's the combination of sure. the art and science that really makes this such a delicious field to be in, and I'm just happy to be able to contribute to it. It's true. I, there's something special about marketing that it. It's a laboratory, so you're able to take a step back and look at an ongoing process and, and see and, and evaluate and tweak. And it almost like it's, it has something for everyone, too. So it has the go creative, go create the ad campaign or copy. But someone else, maybe you or someone else on the team, is going to be looking at the numbers. And you can actually see the numbers. It's not just a billboard. It's, it's a banner and, or it's a, it's a click-through rate. And we can see all these different metrics and we can evaluate and we can improve and optimize. And the best part of the case is when the two really do come together. Yeah. So one of my favorite, favorite stories, so in the new book, I, I spend a lot of time talking about Electronic Arts, the gaming company. You know, they yeah. don't use an outside ad agency for, to come up with any of the creative. Really? Every company goes to the ad agency and says, come up with some awesome ads. Right. Well, they don't do that. They look at lifetime value. They say, hey, what kinds of customers have had the greatest increase in lifetime value over the past six months? And what aspects of the game are they using? What, what, what scenes do they like best? What activities, what features do they like best? And let's go out there and create ads that really focus on those features and scenes and all that sort of thing. So wow. they're coming up with their creative on the basis of lifetime value. So it's, it's being done seamlessly within the organization, which again, takes a lot of creativity and courage yeah. to do that. I'm trying to use them and other companies like them as role models to, to, to bring it all together and to find greater effectiveness through quantitatively driven creativity and, and creative quantification. It, 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 we're all part of the same team. Uh, you know, it's it, it definitely a movement, but it, it makes sense. It's rational, but I, I can see it also takes leadership inside these companies. You, it, you know, if it's an isolated individual, one executive, but there's 30 other ones, you got to speak the financial language. You got to. Along these lines, because you're so right that the, the, yeah. the, the hero of that story is their chief analytics officer, Zachary Anderson. Every one of you, check out Zach Anderson, Electronic Arts. Okay. Suede senior management to. to do this stuff and to go out there and build an incredible wow. team and to get buy-in across the organization for it. Uh, so uh, it, it, the most impressive part of that story isn't the tactical execution, but it's the organizational change and the way to, to, to really build a culture around. And I'm not a cultural guy. 
Uh, I, I can't even give advice about how to do that. I can only point to people who do it well. In fact, I understand that even if you have the lifetime value magic wand, it ain't nothing unless you can do those other things, which frustrates me because I can't. <laughs> right. It's all the application, right? All together. That's right. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. All the application of it, it's not the rest of it. So, so you, so you got into marketing early on, right out of school? Or exactly. Yeah. So, so right from undergraduate days at MIT, this, this crazy professor talked me into the PhD program, got the PhD at MIT, came right down to Wharton, been on the faculty here for 33 years. Wow. Developing all kinds of models, uh, but not content just to stop within the ivory tower. I want models that are addressing practical problems and do so in practical ways and then surround them with all the content and motivations to get companies to actually use it. I mean, first and foremost, it really is about writing a bunch of academic papers. You can see all those journals <laughs> back there filled with Greek letters and all that sort of stuff. Sure. That's, what, that's what my job is, but I don't stop there. And if I can't get companies to buy into this stuff, then I have to question whether it really is good research or not, even if it's getting published. And the fact that I've been so fortunate to be able to, to, to get a lot of research out there, but at the same time have some impact on practice, um, I mean, that's just, just incredibly satisfying. And uh, 33 years in and a long way to go, the best is yet to come. It's amazing that you've been doing that for 33 years because I, I tend to have this sort of um, view of, of school. I mean, I was not such a great student. Uh, I was kind of that entrepreneur looking, you know, my, my best experience in school is running a theater company, you know, and that was that, that practical application. My grades did not exactly reflect that, that process, but I, uh, you know, and, and so I love the fact that you're not only spending time on the research and that's necessary, but also you keep pushing and testing it against real life, right? So that it, you're able to study it, but also not be so, you know, far removed from I, it. You have no I idea. can't imagine any other way of doing it. That, right. that if we're not doing research, that, that matters. And by the way, it factors all the way into the teaching as well. My philosophy is I got to teach what I love and love what I teach. Right. Too many faculty and too many disciplines. It's I'm doing my research and oh, I better stop that. It's time to go into the classroom. For me, it all fits together. So all this stuff that we're talking about, how to calculate and leverage lifetime value, those are my courses. And I want to find just the best and brightest MBA students and undergraduates and have them come join me. And so like all the co-founders of these companies are former students of mine. Yeah. In fact, every one of the people at Beta Equity Partners is a Wharton alum. Wow. Uh, and so it, it just, it, it makes it so fulfilling in order to, uh, I, 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 and I want to be careful about drawing a, a line between the, the academic work and the commercial but at the same time to blur the lines so that I, I can uh, find ways to, to, to leverage the best of each into the other. Yeah, I respect that tremendously. Uh, and, and I can see the fact that your company, the fact that you would, would have a company and the fact that it got acquired is just 10x that. But uh, so much respect for that. I remember one of, the, one of the few professors that I really respect and like everything you know, he said I paid attention to had run his own PR firm. And so this was a communications class and he was talking about press release and whatever, you know, it was, I was just like, okay, well he does this, you know, and he also had a, a class on like fiction writing and he had written fiction, but I had read his book and it was really cool. And so I just respected that he was constantly in and doing things and then sharing what he learned the hard way. Right, right, right. And look, we're in a business school. It's not just a school. It's a business, business school. school. Now I have to admit that I, I've been here 33 years, and while I've had these startups, they're pretty recently. So for most of my career, don't get the wrong idea, <laughs> for the most part, I'm just you know, doing academic stuff, wanting to get practice out there, but for the most part, just handing it to students and companies saying, you do it. Right. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm so thrilled that I've had the opportunity, almost, I, I could talk more about it, but just sort of be shoved into the entrepreneurial seat, wish it had happened earlier, uh, uh, because it's just so much fun to, to, to get in the trenches and to go out there and raise money and sell and, uh, and, and kind of learn from, from mm -hmm. how companies are pushing back or how they're using it. Uh, that, that helps the research. It helps the teaching. It all fits together. But it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. I mean, there's the school of doing it, but there's also something to be said for learning from people that study it constantly and have also tested it and done it as well. I remember evaluating, you know, should I get an MBA or not? And, and previously, it's like, well, I don't know if I could handle having a professor with less followers than I do on Twitter teaching me about social media. But when I hear you talk about some of these things, I'm like, well, obviously I got to go buy the book tomorrow or today on Amazon, which we were talking about. Uh, so that, that, you know, I could see why Wharton has that reputation. It sounds like they've got a good program going on. Yeah. I'm, I'm again, I'm thrilled not only for my mentors at MIT who shoved me into this, but for my mentors and colleagues here at Wharton, where that idea of being absolutely leading edge academically, but also going out there and doing stuff. I mean, so right. many of my colleagues have done similar kinds of things, whether it's starting companies or not, but having kind of very direct, meaningful impact on practice. We really do value that. And this, this kind of virtuous cycle of as we go out there and do stuff, it actually enhances the research and the teaching and uh, all the way around. Uh, I'm, again, just, just so thrilled that I've been able to kind of ride that wave. Uh, and I think as all this quantitative marketing stuff becomes more commonplace and there's more demand for it, uh, I, I just can't even imagine just how fun these next few years are going to be yeah i'm excited to see the the metric side of marketing continue to increase and you know i want it needed to be i don't say catch up but like evenly yoked with the creative side so that right. it's to your point it's meshed it's it's part and parcel with each other that yeah, makes exactly makes sense. And so many of the examples that i point to like the electronic arts one is more exception than rule um so let's flip that and again i'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow Right. Because there's so much of the mindset, the cultural, the organizational change, uh, and that takes a generation. Uh, right. But if we can just sow the seeds and, 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 and talk to a broad array of people, uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that, that generational change. I just hope that I can you know, be around long enough to yeah. see it take place. Well, you look like you, you started teaching when you were born. So <laughs> like, keep going, keep doing it. I, so question, if you were to hop in a time machine and go back and talk to yourself, you know, 33 years ago, the beginning of your, you know, that marketing professorship, a marketing career, if you will, like what would, advice would you give yourself back then? Oh, absolutely. I, I mentioned before, but let me highlight it now. Um, I was always afraid of doing the entrepreneurial thing. So for so many years, my students would say, these models are amazing. Why don't you go out there and commercialize them? And I'd say, why don't you commercialize them? And right. many did. Um, but I, I, I always thought it wasn't my place. I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I'll be too distracted by it. Uh, but having now gone through it twice in the last five years, uh, I wish I had done it earlier mm -hmm. uh, for, for lots of reasons. Number one, it's, it's fun. There's money to be made. But also there's a really good education. I mean, I have to admit, Casey, don't tell anyone this, but I'll have students sit across from me and they'll talk about their startups and they'll talk about the funding rounds and all this kind of stuff. And I'll sort of nod along and pretend they know what they're talking about. But getting in the trenches and actually doing it and being held accountable was such a wonderful education. I can now talk to them. I could be an advisor and really know right. what I'm talking about. Uh, so I think we, we owe it to ourselves both for credibility as well as just, you know, entertainment value and commercial opportunity to get in there earlier and to understand that sometimes you're going to fail, but that's okay. Right. We got a day job. Right. Uh, so I wish I had done it sooner. Uh, there are so many other things I could have done mm -hmm. uh, along those lines, but at the same time, uh, it, you know, uh, uh, you can teach this old dog new tricks and, and I'm really glad I had a chance to, to to have that and, and there's more to come. It sounds like it. It makes you a better teacher in the process. No uh, doubt. So, you know, really kind of closing up here, but question about, you know, any sort of passions you have. That's obviously the numbers are still important, but like routines that you might do on a daily basis. Yeah, the, the thing that keeps me sane is swimming. Nice. Uh, and uh, just having that kind of hour a day, swimming a mile and a half and thinking of you know, stupid number pattern things and counting laps sure. and thinking about the square roots of those numbers or whatever else, uh, that, that, that is, is, is my thing. That's what kind of gives me balance. And it's not bad for you either. Uh, so I can work 24-7 as long as I can kind of get that, that, that swim in every day. Uh, and again, it, it's that, 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 that balance or weird imbalance of life 
I'm just so fortunate to, to live in a condo that has a swimming pool. That's right. I do that uh, uh, 365 days a year. How do you, if you're off thinking about numbers, because I, I love swimming for that, thoughts and, uh, but how do you remember to then turn around and not hit the wall? <laughs> muscle memory for you at this point? I, I, at this point, a, a lot of it is that. Okay. But really, I, I, and, and so, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Just to kind of get that, that mental clarity, to kind of get that sort of zen-like, trance-like thing you know, a lot of people get it from running, but yeah. I find swimming where you really are in this kind of just, just weird, no distraction kind of thing. Well, maybe you are losing count of the laps. So you swim a few <laughs> extra, whatever. Uh, it, it just that, 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 just that way of, uh, of kind of getting inside yourself, but in a way that's also <laughs> pretty good for you. Um, when I go a, a day without it, something's missing. Yeah, you can't, can't beat it. Kind of cleans the slate beginning of the day, lets you process. It's almost like, you know, the old computers clearing your cash. You know, it, very much that way. And also lets you eat more too. It, that's true. And then, and then when you get that dessert, you're like, well, I swam today. Exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. Where, where can people connect? What's good? Where do people reach out? You know, LinkedIn, Twitter. LinkedIn, Twitter. You, you, you named it. So okay. uh, Twitter handle Fader P. Um, love to engage with, with people that way. LinkedIn as well. Happy to connect with, with everyone, or anyone there. I'm posting things on both those platforms all the time. Tons and tons of content out there. If people just Google my name, they'll just find all kinds of, of, of videos and, and just and blog posts and stuff like that. But also make sure uh, interested people should, should check out the, the new startup betaequity.com. Again, I'm not pitching it, but some of the content posted there where we show how we do this, this reverse engineering of a company's IPO statements, you might find that interesting in and of itself, but also it's just a great way to show how we can couch all this marketing stuff in finance language. Right. And I think is, is kind of a nice role model. So uh, yeah, there are lot, lots of good content out there and I hope you can tell my passion for it. Very happy to in, engage with others about it. Absolutely. And, and maybe even go to Wharton, attend a class. Uh, you know, that, that's up, part of the it? thing. If I could find yeah. people to come here and fall under my evil spell, yes. start working on some of these kinds of things, that's a win-win. Absolutely. And then also the book. We'll make sure we put the link to the book and also that workbook on implementing it um, as well. We'll put those in the show notes for everyone. Just link right over to Amazon and hit purchase so you can Again, the hard part is actually applying it. So this is fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on here. I feel like I have my own private class today. Well, K Casey, it is, is a pleasure. It really is. Good, great, great, great questions and comments. And, uh, and again, I thank you for the opportunity for me to be able to spread the gospel and get other people to take some of these thoughts that they've had already and just crystallize them and just make them a little bit bolder about going out and doing some of this kind of stuff. And then to tell me all about uh, some of their success stories or frustrations right. with it, because it's a conversation that has a long way to go. Absolutely. Lifetime value. There it is. You know, for everyone listening, if you've learned something from this, and I know you have, because I literally have pages of notes over here that I've taken. Uh, so if you've learned something, share this with someone else. Be a thought leader in your own space and get this content out to someone else, even if it's just a coworker, a parent, sibling. Share it with someone. Get that information out there. And I'm going to go get the workbook. Uh, so you know, stay tuned and, and check in on Twitter on that one. But Otherwise, you know, Peter, thank you again so much for being here. Casey, absolutely my pleasure. Uh, keep up the good work and keep pronouncing that big word. Oh, oh. heterogeneity. <laughs> you got it. Because it's different. <laughs> All right. Heterogeneity. I'm going to have to go back to the classroom now. <laughs> All right. Heterogeneity. 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 Perfect. Well, thanks again, man. This has been fantastic. And uh, for everyone else out there, this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. We'll see you all next time.